Welcome to Animology, a podcast about language, the animal-related words and expressions we use every day, and how they affect and reflect our relationship with animals. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. I'm your host, and you can find me at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com and this podcast at AnimologyPodcast.com. You can also find Animology Podcast on Twitter at AnimologyPod, and you can find me on Facebook at Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Of course, be sure to subscribe to Animology at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for sharing this podcast and leaving ratings and reviews. Word of mouth is the best way to share. And of course, supporting it is the best way to keep it going. So please help support this podcast at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Dispersed between and among our regular episodes of Animology are special episodes in which I sit down with other language junkies to talk about animal-related words and expressions. Today's episode is How Animals Disappear in Our Language with Carol J. Adams. Language doesn't merely have the effect of dehumanizing. It deanimates, it objectifies. Those are the words of today's guest on animology, my friend and colleague, Carol J. Adams, whose work spans across so many disciplines, as you'll hear, including etymology, linguistics, feminism, and animal advocacy. Our conversation today wends through those parallel and converging paths as we explore where the animals go when we eat meat how the word meat has changed over the centuries, the effect of zero plurals, and stay tuned for what the heck that means, and the power of words to objectify, diminish, and dismember an individual, words. Carol J. Adams is an activist, an independent scholar, and the author of numerous books, including The Sexual Politics of Meat, a feminist vegetarian critical theory now in a Bloomsbury Revelations edition celebrating its 25th anniversary. Carol is a paradigm shifter, a groundbreaker, a truth teller, and I am proud to call her my friend and colleague. We share a love of language, a love of justice and animals and etymology and literature, all of which we cover in my conversation with this legend and pioneer. So sit back, take a listen and enjoy. It really is such an honor and a pleasure and a joy to have you here, Carol, talking to you on Animology. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Colleen, for wanting to have me be part of this. I remember how late did we stay up when we were in Cleveland (laughs) talking about all these ideas and other ideas? I I think we stayed up a little late, uh, so it's it's great to be talking to you in the middle of the day. <laughs> I agree. I remember that night so fondly. That was quite a few years ago, so we have to have more of those nights. I, I yes. actually look forward to that. So your work and your life, they're so rooted in and spread across so many disciplines, so many causes. All of them intersect. They all complement and inform one another. Feminism, ecology animal rights, veganism, domestic violence, caregiving, spirituality, linguistics, language, and literature. It's so impressive. And can you talk about how language and linguistics and literature, the word, have informed and influenced your activism and your own writing? Oh, Let me separate those into two questions. Let's talk about literature, how literature has affected me. Um, I think as an activist, I've needed fiction and literary writings and sort of the literary nonfiction. I've needed that throughout my life just to remind me of sort of what's beautiful in the world and what's good and what gives joy. So, for instance, in the 1980s, I was very involved in activism against racism. And at night, I'd I'd read novels. And I was also reading some history of racism and and American history, just so that I could understand where we were in the 80s. But literature is a guiding light. Literature sort of deepens how we experience the world. And during different decades, I've clung on to different writers. I would say by 20s and my 30s, it was Virginia Woolf all the time. 
and her diaries, her journals, her novels, her nonfiction. In my 50s, when I was caregiving, it was Jane Austen all the time. Mm -hmm. There was something about Jane Austen's humor and the situation she created and even the tension she created that sustained me during long periods of caregiving. Um, In terms of language and word study, I've always been interested in etymology. And back when I was at Yale Divinity School in the 70s, I actually did a paper on words, words about women and how they've changed over the centuries and how words about women in the 17th century that were negative sort of, they got used enough that they no longer had the impact. And so there were new new words about women uh, that were labeling them often as too talkative. Um, there's a lot of language uh, that uh, implies that women were just talking too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was also interested in etymology to follow the history of a word to its present incarnation. We, we know that, for instance, after the Norman conquest in 1066 of, of Britain, how words about animals changed and words about meat, so that there would be the Anglo-Saxon words and then the sort of Norman words that elevated uh, 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 words about meat, so that you, it, it was a very interesting... Um, sort of melding of, of words. So I sort of take the light intellectual curiosity, but also a political interest in the way words become sledgehammers. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. I think we really would be able to be up all night, several nights in a row, just talking about that. And we are going to get to etymology and the Norman conquest and And it was a book. It was a book that led to your own seminal work, was it not? It was a book that you were reading that influenced your own use of the absent uh, referent uh, when you were thinking about writing your own book. Well, I, in terms of writing the sexual politics of meat, I had the idea in 1974 and the first attempt at writing a book was in 1976 And I stopped because I thought, well, what am I saying besides there's this example of women being viewed as animals and there's this example of animals being viewed as female-like or or sexualized, but what's my theory? And during the 1980s, I was working on why Frankenstein's monster was a vegetarian Mm -hmm. and came upon this book bearing the word. And in the first few pages, she introduced this concept of the absent referent, which um, an example would be words worth walking out in in the in uh, the Lake District of England and coming upon daffodils, um, and then going home and writing the poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud. The argument about the absent referent is that the daffodils were the absent referent. If they were present to him, he would not be writing the poem. The poem is a recollection of something that's no longer there. So it's, it's being, it's motivated the poem, but it's not present. And I remember putting the book down and thinking that's what animals used in animal agriculture are their animal absent reference. Mm -hmm. And then I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I must have dreamt about it because I thought, and that's what women are too in a patriarchal culture. Well, and that's one of the beauties of also reading and reading literature and reading other disciplines is that it does, it expands our way of thinking about the world. And that's what's so, uh, so helpful. You know, uh, so many activists talk about, you know, all the, all the activism related books they're reading. And I encourage them to read literature and read poetry and read history and read so much more that will inform and inspire your activism and, your work. So the concept of the absent referent had already existed uh, as a term in linguistics, but you picked it up and you, you popularized it, but politicized it for sure in the concept in the sexual politics of meat as a way to describe 
what you just said, the detachment that occurs between the consumer and the missing other, the missing living animal when people eat animal-based meat. So tell us more about that. Please articulate in your own (laughs) words what that means. What I realized was that it was actually functioning at three different levels, Uh, that the absent referent is the actual animal who disappears as a living being and uh, is killed to become uh, uh, food for humans or what we some people see as food for humans. That's the literal disappearance. Then there's the language change. We don't generally say we're eating a dead cow, the dead cow has become a hamburger, or the dead calf has become veal. Um, even possession changes. It's not a lamb's leg or a chicken's leg in which possession remains with the animal in question. It's already fragmented. It's leg of lamb. It's a, it's chicken legs or chicken wings. You know, the possessive is gone. So the relationship or the idea of the animal disappears. And then the third way that the absent referent is functioning is metaphorically that we take the experience of the animal and we apply it to others or to to explain our own oppression. So what I found was that a lot of women who'd experienced uh, sexual violence were saying they felt like a piece of meat. And uh, so the experience of the animal has disappeared at another level. Mm-hmm. Let me just stop. My dogs are barking. Yeah, I, okay. I know they want to be, they want to <laughs> participate. Uh, they're outside. Should I shut the door so that they're not quite as involved and become a little more absent themselves? Perhaps. <laughs> Hold on. Just a second. Okay. They have a lot of opinions themselves about <laughs> animals. So I can see I, that. I think the breakthrough of the absent referent for me was that it helped me understand why why we don't care and, and why these issues sort of disappear. That there's this structure that actively works to disappear the experience of someone who's being oppressed. So that was very liberating for me. And I think the reason the book resonates for so many people is it gave them a theoretical place to stand and understand why simply having an argument with a meat eater, for instance, uh, Mm. might not work because the structure of the absent referent has already captured sort of the ideological framework of our country, of our world, of, of, of the dominant culture. And so it's, it's like a wedge in, it's a wedge into the dominant culture to say, there's actually something that explains why why we why, why we aren't naming this accurately mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah so would you say then is it accurate to say that that the concept of the absent referent necessitates uh, the cognitive dissonance that that leads to the cognitive dissonance i it enables it enables, enables the, okay. yeah, it, mm-hmm. it enables the cognitive mm-hmm. dissonance mm-hmm. because the referent is there and not there uh, there in in the flesh dead uh, but not there conceptually, or there to some degree, so that there are some people who really want to work with that sort of free zone, like I am eating a dead animal, or look, you know, uh, become very aggressive. They, they're they working with it to a degree, but not completely. So there's, I, I like the word fungible for this. It becomes sort of fungible. They're uh, uh, shape-shifting just like we shapeshift animals after they're, mm. they're dead. Mm. So, so a lot of people don't know, and I, I, it's just so exciting to reveal this to people, that the word meat in Old English originally referred to all food in general. It referred to food that was eaten rather than to distinguish it from a beverage that was drunk. And we still have remnants of it in words or phrases like coconut meat, or we say the meat of a nut. So we still have remnants of the use of that word meat to refer to food and not the flesh of animals, which is how we think of it today. And what I also find interesting 
is that because the word meat wouldn't necessarily have referred to the flesh of an animal, the Anglo-Saxons would have used a word like flesh meat, which would have been a common term to refer to the flesh of animals used for consumption. And it's very interesting because they, because the Anglo-Saxon language was based on the Germanic roots, they would have said things like, and I'm not going to speak Old English, but they would have said things like lamb flesh and sheep flesh and calf flesh, hen flesh, swine flesh, to distinguish the living animal from the eaten one, because they would have just said lambs or geese or sheep as the living animals, but then to distinguish between that living and the dead animal, they would have said, they would have had this compound word with flesh. And we see that even in some constructs in German and even in French today. And the term cow meat, interestingly, endured in the Yorkshire dialect well into the 1950s. So what are your thoughts about the use of cow meat and lamb flesh when we're talking about the flesh of a dismembered animal? Oh, I should pull out sexual politics of meat. You're asking me such a good question. Because I looked at a linguistic analysis, or not a linguistic, a language analysis about when we appended flesh. And and more recently, a flesh would be appended to an animal who wasn't regularly eaten. Um, like, and, like horse flesh. Right. Right. And so that you, Or horse you, meat. Right. So that you 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 were often distinguishing it that way um, with this appendage or that flesh would get attached uh, that way. I think it's also interesting, people are very confused about meat when it's used in the King James Version of the Bible Mm -hmm. because at that point, meat would have had both those meanings, uh, all food or meat as uh, uh, flesh of animals. So people get you know, maybe confused about that. Uh, also, I think then people, they they want to know, well, why, why are you eating something that looks like meat if you're a vegan? Why are you using that word, you know, plant, meat from plants? Or uh, because the, the word narrowed in meaning, but the history got lost. And so people can't appreciate that that narrowing caused us to lose an understanding. So, for instance, something that's the meat of the matter. Uh, you know, I'll often joke and say, oh, that's the tofu of the matter, or this is the, the, the tofu, uh, uh, just trying to substitute that for phrases that use meat. And, and people kind of look at me sort of dumbstruck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, if we could liberate meat out of, it's limited concept today. I think people might not feel there was this sort of either or, where you either eat meat or you don't eat anything that looks like meat. Exactly. Yeah. So it's one of the, I've been talking about that for so long is that, and I, I think when people hear it, it it gives them permission when they hear coconut meat and nut meat because it gives them a familiar context because they say, oh yeah, I do, we do say coconut meat and we do say the meat of a nut. So it gives them permission and, and it shows that we're already using it. This isn't about using some archaic term and trying to revive it just willy-nilly. It's, we're saying that no, there is a legitimate context in which we still use that definition of the word meat. So it's legitimate to say plant-based meat and you know plant-based burger or plant sausage or what have you grain-based etc and uh, and it really makes a difference in our language certainly talking about the plant-based meats in a positive way Paul Shapiro and I just talked about this in an interview on animology about the language around the plant-based milks and and meats etc and uh, just to further what you were saying Carol so yes yeah, so there's a uh, in the King James Bible, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 30, it, there, it says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And so literally people think, <laughs> oh, so wait, I don't understand you're giving green herb for meat. Well, meat would have meant food. So the passage really would just say, I've given every uh, uh, green plant for or food, essentially. But when people read that, they don't know the context of the meaning of the word meat at the time. 
Right. Well, I, in fact, I was going to cite the, the verse that comes before there, 129, which is such a key verse in terms of establishing that at least uh, in, in the Garden of Eden, um, people would have been vegan because that's where God says, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat. So it's not saying this is your substitute for meat. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> As right. we see, I think about it today, <laughs> this is your food. Right. Right. And so because King James Version is still used a lot and it's po- much more so poetic and evocative that people hear that and they don't know what they're hearing. Exactly. And even another uh, semantic fossil is uh, the, uh, I think it's a 16th century word, uh, sweet meat, which means a sweet confectionery, like a candy, uh, as sugared cake or something like that. Sweet bread, on the other hand, is a completely different story, and it does refer to the innards of an animal. But sweet meat uh, refers to, you know, a sweet food, a candy, candy food. So I love taking back that word and liberating that word, as you said. It's, it's so important. So what are some of your then, what are your preferences when you're talking about the flesh of animals uh, for consumption? What are some of the terms that you use? Well, throughout Neither Man Nor Beast, which I did in 1994, I used the word corpse. And it's not a favorite in terms of that I, I find this uh, beneficial to think about because uh, I think it's sad that people eat animal corpses. But it was a deliberate decision not to use the word carcass because this is one of those human, non-human uh, animal disparities that we have in language. So a human has a corpse, but a non-human only has a carcass. So I deliberately at the last minute realized I, I don't want carcass anywhere. And I just went through and mm-hmm. changed the whole thing to corpse mm-hmm. to try to raise uh, a little consciousness about that. Um, I, you know, people have said, why do you call it the sexual politics of meat? Uh, why aren't you calling it the sexual politics of flesh? Or, you know, why have you accepted meat, uh, which is a euphemism? And I've said, I've got to start somewhere. Yeah. I mean, this book was seen as so far out and yeah. so uh, inapplicable to the average person who, I mean, there was this real worry that there was no readership for it, yeah. that I've got to start somewhere where we have some shared language, even if my goal is to move people further from the shared assumptions of language. Mm-hmm. So would you still use corpse then today? In a, in oh, yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, in, in this article I did called The War on Compassion, uh, which is in the Carol J. Adams Reader, which came out last year, I was looking at, at some other ways that, that we... Um, use language, not just, it's like we take the human animal divide and we then reinscribe it at another level, dominant humans versus non-dominant humans. So dominant humans will have qualities we associate with being human and the non-dominant humans will, will have qualities that are associated with animals. And so um, at one example is the kind of language that's used to discuss uh, Latinos in newspapers that researchers found metaphors of immigrants as animals that they were lured, pitted, or baited, that mm. they were like um, animals and that they could be attacked or hunted. The whole um, sort of immigrant crisis frenzy that we've got going on now in language um, by uh, the right wing uh, Republicans is, is an example that animals, um, I found one that was really interesting, American citizens, United States citizens give birth, but in their study, they found that emigrants drop their babies. Mm. So there were different ways that language is used to separate out who's worthy of life and who's not worthy of life. Mm. And that always concerns me, Mm. the way that language... It's not dehumanizing. It is because it, 
I, I don't like dehumanizing because it's implying it's something that only happens to humans. Mm-hmm. Language deanimates. Mm-hmm. Uh, language objectifies. Um, so I'm always sort of acutely aware of that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We will return to my conversation with Carol in just a moment, but just a quick break to let you know that Animology is brought to you by you, the listeners of this podcast. Think of patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau as a tip jar. If you appreciate what you hear in this podcast, you can show your appreciation by filling up the tip jar. Not only does your support make everything that goes into this podcast possible, the research, the writing, the preparation, the recording, the editing, the file hosting, the social media marketing. You also enjoy some perks, such as written transcripts to each and every episode, which is really helpful for a podcast about words. So check out the different levels and show your appreciation by adding a tip to the jar at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can also go to animologypodcast.com and click on the donate button and join other supporters like our platinum supporters, Morgan Hall, David Cabrera, Alexander Gray, Gwen Mayo, Michal Stone, Amanda Kless, Jennifer and Ben Ellis, Tim Anderson, Ulrich, Renee Marinkovich, Sylvie Raquel, and Peter Liu. And a huge thank you also to A Well-Fed World. A Well-Fed World is a hunger relief and animal protection organization whose grant is also making this podcast possible. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Yeah, so one of the things that I think, you know, people start thinking about when they're thinking about their own consumption of animals is when they start to realize the euphemisms that we have that do mask the living animals. So, of course, in 1066, Norman invasion, influx of French words into England and the English language. And we start to now see a distinction. So we don't, so we have Anglo-Saxons still, obviously still calling the uh, the living animals by their Anglo-Saxon Names, steer, bull, cow, ox, calf, pig, boar, swine, goose, chicken, doe, buck, stag, deer. All these are old English words. And then there starts to be, and and so no longer saying pig flesh or swine flesh, but there starts to be an influx uh, influx of the French words that we still use today, which came into English. And now we use veal, beef, pork, poultry, venison mutton. And so our language continues to reinforce animals as the absent referent and and creates that cognitive dissonance necessary to continue eating them. And it's really interesting because the research is bearing this out, even though you already knew this and it's already in, in your work for years, but the research is bearing this out. It's really interesting because there's a lot more research coming out about the psychology of, of eating meat, animal meat, uh, and this cognitive dissonance. There was a study by two researchers at the University of Oslo in Norway recently, and it concluded that both how we present meat, both how we present the, the, uh, the animal meat and what we name the dishes affects our empathy towards the animal and our desire to eat the dish. So in the study, the scientists found that calling meat, cow and pig rather than beef and pork reduced participants' willingness to eat the meat dishes. And in addition, seeing meat um, in a more whole form, such as a roasted pig with his head still on uh, truly whole uh, uh, and or viewing lamb chops next to the image of a living lamb also reduce participants willing willingness to eat uh, to eat animal based meat and uh, and they concluded that in order to consciously eat meat we have to create this distance between what we're eating and the animal who was once living yes i th- I'm, I'm glad to know there's been a study now uh, i think that that probably holds true for the vast majority of people who eat dead animals. Um, there's probably a few who really re- revel, revel in that and, and celebrate it uh, and, and find that it's okay. But I, I think it probably is true what they found the vast majority. I think that one of the things we have to talk about is the reason this language works it, it, and it's part of the second chapter of the sexual politics of me where I introduce the absent referent is that it's objectifying and that objectifying language 
generally moves from the specific to the general mm-hmm. and moves from recognizing someone as an individual to seeing them as part of a group or as not being equal or uh, functioning at the same level. So, for instance, uh, this is probably going to be more helpful to give an example than to keep talking at this theoretical level. Uh, In domestic violence, it's been found that often a batterer, before uh, battering, will have begun to distance uh, himself from the act of violence by not calling his partner by her first name, mm. but starting to call her bitch or C-U-N-T or uh, cow, uh, hen, uh, that the first step is this distancing through language, that they aren't, they are no longer, for instance, Carol or Colleen. We become a part of a group or part of a, a non-valuable group uh, or part or fragmented uh, into parts. We saw this last year uh, with Hillary Clinton's campaign, how many people uh, would, uh, you know, they were just saying jail the C-U-N-T. She was already fragmented so that she was not, she wasn't seen as a whole person. Um, so this is kind of fragmenting or distancing language that that's objectifying the being before they are harmed so that the harm is not experienced as happening to someone who matters. Well, and gosh, I mean, we do that just right off the bat, just in terms of us completely separating ourselves from animals, literally and linguistically by not even attributing the, our animalness. We just don't even accept and embrace our animalness. We distance ourselves from our own animalness and, and quite literally talk about animals in, and embrace their um, violence and their viciousness such that when humans create the most heinous acts of violence, we call them animals, as if to project that onto non-human animals to distance ourselves from those very tendencies, human tendencies. Right. And I mean, brutal is a good example of that. The word brutal, which mm-hmm. which um, we know it was often used against animals, brutes, brute, uh, brute strength, brute whatever. And then brutal is often used to describe a terrible crime or, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, these animals, they were so brutal. And this is having a double effect. First of all, it is libeling animals. Meanwhile, it is depriving us of an accurate analysis of how deliberate and planned uh, forms of violence against humans can be. So that uh, a domestic violence, the, we often have this notion that someone's lost control, and this is why they're battering. But we know now that someone is in complete control, and this is why they're battering. So when we call what they've done as brutal or animal-like, we are taking away the deliberateness and the planning, and we're not going to be able to analyze it or stop it. As long as we continue to see it as animal-like passions or animal-like whatever, we've, we've got, we fail at the analysis. Lots of rapes are planned, are deliberate, and yet the rapist is animal is uh, uh, constantly found. The other thing is that most rapes are against someone who the rapist knows. But what we see in papers, in in newspapers and all, are often those uh, things that Susan Estrick called the real rape, the rape against a stranger. And those rapes are often the ones that are labeled savage and brutal and where the um, the rapist is really uh, laden with these animal connotations, but but it was a deliberate planned act, and it completely disappears. The agency disappears when we use terms that are libeling animals. Mm. Well, and furthering that, so and also 
taking that word meat and and furthering that into women being depicted as pieces of meat. And so, it, I mean, these implications then go even just so they're so broad and they're so, and they're so deep. Can you talk about how the word meat then relates to objectifying and dismembering both both animals and women? <laughs> so, I think that what we see happening is the place where these absent reference intersect. So you have women disappearing as being in possession of our own lives, our own bodies, in a culture that's constantly uh, fixated on women's bodies and uses advertisements to to sell things. Um, Women's bodies become sort of emblematized through meat, either cut up where women are shown cut up as though they are a piece of meat, the famous cattle queen that's on the cover of the sexual politics of meat, which is a trope that just reiterates and reiterates throughout culture. We're still seeing it now. And or women's bodies marked um, by a brand, uh, women's bodies um, discussed and, and described, are you a breast man, are you a leg man? All of this, because mm-hmm. the other thing that fragmentation of an animal does is, as you said, you know, you're not seeing the head, you're not seeing the eyes, you're not seeing a whole being. And so whenever women are fragmented, they're fragmented in advertisements and they're fragmented in a lot of heterosexual pornography. Um, you're just seeing a part of a body and it's harder to feel empathy with a part. Mm-hmm over empathy with it, with an entire being. And so that then leads, uh, in my theory, to consumption, the consummation of violence uh, against animals and the consumption of women's images. All of that creating an atmosphere where uh, women as meat becomes a sexualized commodification of two bodies simultaneously you know talk about fungible <laughs> yeah, right right I, it's so fascinating because it's so powerful and it's so deeply entrenched because when we're talking about whole and the whole animal the whole body the whole person the language in marketing is so powerful because whole chickens are sold being called whole chickens yeah, right and they're dismembered there's That's no head right. there's no wings there are no legs. There's no innards. There's no There's innards, no, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, well, I mean, and that's where, in the sexual politics of meat, the most deceptive language I challenged, uh, again, in chapter two, which I think is sort of the, the tofu of the book, uh, <laughs> in terms of really trying to articulate a theory that would help us, I talked about the problems, or maybe that was chapter three, because chapter three is the language chapter. I talk about the the lie that's implicit in humane slaughter and forcible rape. Mm, I love that. Talk about that. All rape is forcible. Mm. (laughs) Rape, there isn't like, oh, violent rape and nonviolent rape. Rape is rape. Rape is violent. Uh, And they're uh, humane slaughter as though some sort of adjective can diminish or redefine the, the noun that it's, it's describing. And in both cases, they're working against or they're, what they're doing is they're implying that the noun can be modified. Slaughter is slaughter. You're alive and then you're dead. <laughs> rape is rape. You, are, you think you're inviolable, you're raped, and you have been treated as violable. And we know survivors can reclaim that and, and heal, but there, there's no going back something happened that changed. And so to think that these adjectives, humane or forcible, can somehow diminish or deny or deprive us of a, of a recognition of what is happening to an, an individual, a being, a, a, a living being who, who might have thr- thrived uh, the animal uh, being slaughtered, who, who, who had the right to walk down the street without being raped, 
it changes. It, you know, the interesting thing about these words, they're actually also changing how we look at our environment. Because we think, oh, forcible rape only happens in these cases. Oh, you, you, you went into an area you shouldn't have gone to or whatever. Humane slaughter happens in a certain kind of slaughterhouse, but not in that kind of slaughterhouse. In their words, what they're doing is they're not just modifying these nouns that are nouns of violence. They are modifying how we look at our environment. And that's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's powerful. It really is. It is so interesting. And it can be so subtle because, you know, you said that in response to the study, the Oslo study, that sure, some people are going to revel, certainly, certainly revel in the, uh, that, that seeing the whole pig, seeing the pig's head, et cetera. And we, and we do know that happens. And there are people who would say, well, you know, you say this about the Anglo-Saxon words versus the French terms, so the cow versus the beef and the pig versus the pork, but I could say chicken, I could say turkey, and people can say that, and so clearly there's no cognitive dissonance because it appears that we're calling the, 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 living, animal, the, uh, the living animal, but yet there are these subtle changes that take place in saying, because we, we would say uh, there, the chicken is in the yard, and obviously the, the implication is that the chicken is alive, but we say... I'm going to eat chicken. So the article is removed. And in removing that article, there you have it. You remove, you remove the, the living animal. I often say to people, do you eat chicken? And they say, I love chicken. Love it. Love, I love it. I eat chicken all the time. And I say, when I ask, do you eat chickens? Plural with an S, mm-hmm. they recoil in ho- horror. They, no, I don't, eat, I don't eat chickens because just in pluralizing the word, the animals are no longer absent. It's just so powerful how such a subtle change can really shift people's thinking and perspective. I think there's um, another thing that's going on there, uh, which I talk about in Neither Man Nor Beast, and it's the concept of the mass term. The, this is a concept uh, from philosophy. For instance, uh, a mass term is something that, that's uh, like water. Water is water. You put, I put a pail of water in a, in a pond of water. It's water. It doesn't change it. I put the color red paint in with red paint. It's going to stay red paint. So a mass term is, is, is that sort of thing. But in animal agriculture, we've ended up with false man t- mass terms that uh, somehow cows can become hamburger and nothing's happened. That, that hamburger is this false mass term, cows, chickens, chicken, not plural, turkey, I eat turkey. These are functioning as false mass terms, implying that any part of it is substitute is able to be substituted for another part of it. But an individual cow is a living being with her own experiences and her own desires. And an individual chicken is an individual being. But this false mass term, it's like putting a shroud over consciousness. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. There's also a linguistics term for something, I think it's the same thing, uh, zero plurals. So we, it's a term for the fact that some words for animals have what are called zero plurals. So the noun for the singular and the plural remains the same. So you have right. deer, bison, moose, elk, buffalo, salmon, fish. Fish. Right, fish. And it's really interesting because I'm, I'm extrapolating this theory. There's a theory that this is a linguistic category unto itself reflecting an Anglo-Saxon cultural category of animals who were commonly and are commonly hunted, fished, or shot. So specifically the zero plurals relate to, and if you look at all the animals who we have these zero plurals for, where they're it doesn't change whether they're singular or plural, deer, bison, moose, elk, uh, reflecting possibly a cultural category of animals uh, of those who we kill for yes. sport. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've been trying to say fishes ever since I read Joan Dunnier's book. Um, and it's funny, I get pushback from, from places. In fact, 
I just want to do a little aside and say it's very interesting how copy editing, which most people might not think about as more than correcting a word or whatever, that copy editing is a very political thing. So, for instance, in Sexual Politics of Meat, I wanted to put uh, SIC, which means this is how it was in the, in, in the quote I'm using, but it is not accurate. I wanted to put that next to every reference hmm. to a, hmm. of an animal hmm. as it. Hmm. And my copy editor, this is 1989, went through and took it all out. Yeah. And I went through and put it all back. Uh, so there are times, there were other things like correcting fishes back to fish, where the copy editor, because they're following a style, and the style has come down from a, from a dominant culture's perspective, is going to be in conflict with a writer who's trying to challenge that dominant culture. And you don't think about that well, the battle is left in the margins of a of the proofs of a book. <laughs> it's true. It's it's true. It's so amazing. It's w- one of the things I am working on is actually a guide for journalists and this because it's reflected in journalism all the time in in the media and it's reflecting but it's also creating our language. So obviously the editors are, you know, they're using popular usage and and then we're hearing it and it's being fed back to us and we're using that. And so there's this circular Usage, and I know some journalists are starting to think differently about it. But people, this is a place of activism. I mean, this is a real opportunity for activism around uh, around the, the the language we use and having uh, journalistic guidelines around it versus she. Ver- I mean, we call ships she, we call boats she, <laughs> but right. when they're talking about individual animals. Uh, they use the word it. There was a French linguist who I quote in um, the third chapter of Sexual Politics of Meat, which is my language chapter. And he was looking at when do we refer to animals as he's, when do we look, refer to them as she's, and when do we refer to them as it's. And he's looking specifically at, at rabbit hunting, where the, the rabbit's referred to as a she, and whales, the, the are she blows. Um, and what he decided was that in our culture, there are major powers and there are minor powers, and that the major power is he, and the minor power is she, and that in hunting or in prey animals, whaling, that the major power is defeating the minor power. So the minor power will be referred to as she. Mm. I thought that was interesting because mm, I, see, I see that same thing happening when in our culture, when we talk about God. God's a major power, and we end up referring to God as a he. Mm. Um, so I see that inscribed not just in sport, but but in theology. Mm. Well, moving from the language we use around animal flesh and fluids, certainly that's not the only way we legitimize the consumption of animals. It's also how we talk about vegetables, <laughs> as well as the word vegetable and the negative connotations associated with that and the consumption of vegetables and the consumption of animals. Can you talk about, uh, can you talk about what's going on there? Well, uh, I, I had a lot of fun with that or fun. Uh, it, so this is in the first chapter of the sexual politics of meat, where I'm looking at the use of the word vegetable to refer to someone in a coma. Now, this is not done as much in the 21st century, thankfully, but that that attitude that that someone who's in a vegetative state is is not growing, that vegetables contain the sense of lack of life, lack of consciousness, that the vegetable becomes this, insult uh you vegetated look at anybody who's had a garden knows that vegetating is really a fascinating Mm. thing but um and we know that the word vegetarian at least from what i read and maybe in your research you found something else was being taken from vegetas lively Mm -hmm. uh not from vegetable Mm -hmm. uh in 1847 in england so while you could turn to vegetables and lift this up and just say, this is a remarkable food. Um, and to say that someone is uh, growing like a vegetable is is a compliment. 
our culture took it that, you know, there was the meat of the matter and, and what the king eats, which is uh, meaty, and uh, that all the compliments around something being uh, uh, associated with the king's food versus what's associated with women's food. So women's food becomes equated with this, with this undervalued and or disvalued uh, vegetable. And I wanted to return to the, the Norman conquest and, and the whole evolution of, of eating terms because one of the other things that's going on during those centuries is that the vast majority of meat is being eaten by royalty or um, the aristocrats. And so they were more likely to embrace the French, the Norman terms, the, the French terms uh, as part of the demarcation of class. And so the demarcation of class being meat eaters uh, as aristocrats and royalty versus more likely mainly vegetable eaters as the working class or uh, the, um, the rural folk. Uh, and so it, that then has imposed on it also male over female and meat over vegetable. Yeah, you see that famous passage in Ivanhoe, in uh, Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, when he reflects that very idea that, you know, that there's this kind of playful banter between, uh, you know, the fool, of course, the, the, the wise fool who is talking about the, the difference, quite literally the difference in terms of, well, you know, we eat, we eat swine and they eat pork and we eat. Uh, and so that he's making this literal and uh, linguistic distinction because it's the, it's the aristocrats who are consuming. It's, of course, it's the same thing, but. Uh, right. Well, and then, I mean, the other thing we end up doing with this meat, vegetable, um, viewpoint, and part of this is a disdain or, or a failure to recognize how vegetables offer protein and that vegetables are compete with meat as protein sources, was a notion in the 19th century that the meat-eating countries, the beef-eating countries like the United Kingdom, defeated rice-eating um, countries like India, uh, so that the the meat vegetable dichotomy uh, is inscribed not just uh, in terms of sexes, but it's it's inscribed in terms of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we see that in a lot of phrases. We have couch potato, someone who's fruity was a negative slur against homosexuals, a fruit. Uh, right. To go bananas is to go crazy. A lemon is something that's flawed. Uh, if something's not worth anything, it's worth a hill of beans. Someone's pea-brained. I mean, we have all these. I mean, we have all these very negative uh, phrases around around vegetables and plant foods. And, and to your point, these, the, the, the implications that come from that, the real implications that, that stem from that, that it leads to. But talk about then the dichotomy between the feminized vegetable and the masculinized uh, animal flesh, because there, there are some serious implications to that as well. Uh, well, I think that it then becomes popularized in this notion that veganism is okay for women, that ve you could expect women to become vegans. There's this, this here in Texas, there's a, a chain, and the way they advertise it, they say, so good, even guys like our salads. Mm -hmm. So that the assumption is, oh, well, women will eat any kind of salad, but it's really got to be something wonderful to get a guy to eat it. So we, we, we then have this enacted um, that... Uh, men who become vegans must be somehow, there must be something wrong with their heterosexuality or their virility. Um, so we, we took this sort of, these cultural connotations of meat as being about virility and masculinity that evolved, especially in the 18th and 19th century. And we clung on to it into the 21st century. And um, it's, it's kind of creating this rubber band effect. So that then vegans, well, what do we do? Do we say, oh, no, 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 you know, uh, uh, anybody can be a vegan and you're not going to lose your masculinity if you're a, um, a vegan. But why participate in that? I mean, we're reinforcing the sexual politics of meat by trying to undo that stereotype. Um, 
that's that's my first thought there. <laughs> yeah. So instead of challenging the myths of masculinity, we're changing the words because I've you know the whole idea. I, it's so prevalent, it seems to me, that there's this desire to demonstrate that, to reinforce the dominant culture's idea of what masculinity is by by vegan men who are having to... Plant strong. They're plant, they're plant strong. strong. Hegan is another I know, term. I was going to just say hegan, which uh, thankfully was short-lived, or at least I thought it I was. So. Uh, but I mean, I think, and there are some women who are doing vegan bodybuilding and competing in vegan bodybuilding. I think there's a place for be vegan bodybuilding if that's what vegans want to be doing. But that is not necessary for anyone to prove veganism by bodybuilding. That's right. I mean, that's I just make that distinction. The, the, uh, we we have a tendency to want to have this unitary vegan uh, notion, and and I'm interested in multiplicity. And uh, not some sort of cohesive vegan identity, but a plurality that that deconstructs all sorts of assumptions. Um, I think that the need to prove is part of the sexual politics of meat, Mm -hmm. that the sexual politics of meat is working to always create doubt about this diet of dissent Um, and uh, First of all, our culture, there's so much anxiety in our culture anyway. And people crave more the security of identity than I think they crave mm. the so called, you know, the flesh itself. Mm. Uh, so hopefully, impossible foods and, and beyond meat and, and all, they're going to help people uh, with these transitions. For sure. I would love to ask you if you would come back so we can talk about all of the pejorative language that <laughs> <laughs> that will be a two hour episode. But truly the, the pejorative language that puts down women, lowers the status of animals, puts down men, humans. It's again, this the dichotomy between the, the human animal, the non-human animal. So I would love you to come back. Would you come back so we can talk more? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Of course. Okay. That would be nice. Good. Well, before you go, I have just a couple brief questions for you. First of all, what does the J stand for in Carol J. Adams? Josephine. Okay. Thank you. That and, was my grandmother. Oh, nice. And do you have, it's so hard. This is a terrible question to ask a language lover like yourself, but do you have any favorite words, Carol? Well, I. My first thought is the word beauty, because I love the sound of those three vowels together. Um, And even though it also has in it that sound of euphemism, it has the sound of euphoria. And I think I am trying to be grateful every day for the beauty of the world and the beauty of people working for social justice and uh, the beauty of being alive to be witness and experience uh, our life. And so right now, beauty, because I think in the midst of all that's going on and in, in the midst of having to analyze this and, and know and understand where we've come from and where we're going, it's really important to sometimes just sit down and say, this is a beautiful opportunity. This, this is a beautiful way of, of, of being. This is a gift. And I, I need to stop every day and just say thank you. And I think beauty helps me do that. Well, speaking of celebrating life and its beauty, I saw our dear mutual friend, Patty Brightman, a couple weeks ago, and she told me about a new book you're co-authoring together. (laughs) (laughs) And could you tell us about that book? So Patty and Ginny and I, we did, Ginny Messina, we did Never Too Late to Go Vegan. And last year we were catching up on where we were and what we needed to be doing. And we realized that there was a companion volume needed. We're calling it Even Vegans Die. And it 
we're trying to reach the vegan community around disease shaming and size shaming and what we've decided to call care shaming, that we need to uh, work more around caregiving and, and being responsive uh, to each other in a caring way and from my point of view, working with a philosophical tradition that emphasizes care over rights and utilitarianism. And also we talk about death and dying. If you have a terminal illness, mourning, grief, and the need for every single one of your listeners, if they are over 21, to have a will. So important. So important. So when is it coming out? In April. April of 2017. Yes. No, oh, good. And so it, yeah. pe- people can find it by following you. They can find all the ways to follow you and contact you and read all of your work and see your events and your brilliance over at caroljadams.com. Well, Carol, thank you for bringing so much beauty into the world and so much compassion. You're the epitome of fierce compassion. And I'm so grateful for you, for all that you do and your tireless work. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Colleen. And thanks for this new project. Be sure to check out Carol's work at caroljadams.com. Follow her on social media and support an author and buy her books. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it. Please consider supporting Animology. And most of all, thank you for listening to Animology, changing the way we talk and think about animals. Animals.